All right, so in the next part of our analysis series, we are going to continue on and talk about heterogeneity today. This is also known as homogeneity. Some authors refer to this concept as one or the other of these terms, but essentially we're talking about the same thing. Um, two sides to the same coin. So Lipsy and Wilson typically refer to this concept as homogeneity and Bornstein et al. talk about it as heterogeneity. I'm most used to calling it heterogeneity, so that's what we will refer to this as, but just know that in your readings, when you're seeing both of these, it's just a preference of how folks conceptualize and talk about it, but we're essentially talking about the same thing. But essentially what we're looking at when we're looking at this concept is, are the effect sizes that we got, that we're looking at across all of our studies, are they similar or are they, dis are they disparate? So if our effect sizes are similar, they're going to be homogeneous. If they're disparate, they're going to be heterogeneous. And typically when we are looking at psychological research, usually there is inherent variability, so we're using a random effects model. And usually when we have come to find a topic that we want to answer a question on, there's usually a debate in the field as to where the effectiveness lies, especially if we're talking about a treatment. And that's why we do metas, so that we can figure out what is the true consensus in the field. Let's do an empirical summary and see if we can find out, is it really that treatment is effective or is it not effective? Where does that lie if we summarize all of this empirically? And a lot of the time, <clears throat> there's going to be debate because there's going to be mixed results. And so that's why a lot of us refer to this as heterogeneity when we talk about this, more so than homogeneity. So we're going to talk a little bit more about heterogeneity analysis. So when we're doing this, we're testing the assumption that all of the effect sizes are estimating the same population mean. And we're testing whether or not that's a reasonable assumption that we can make. So the Cochrane's Q, which is generally just referred to as Q, was designed for that purpose. And Q is what's testing this assumption. And so we're saying that it's statistically significant in saying that the effect sizes are heterogeneous. And it's unreasonable to assume that they're testing all of the same population, meaning they're testing the same effect size. You'll notice that when you read Lipsy and Wilson, they say to calculate Q, and that if Q ends up being statistically significant, then you should choose a random effects model over a fixed effect model. Bornstein et al. actually contradicts that a bit more recently in the meta-analysis literature and says <clears throat> that in actuality, you should be choosing whether you go with a fixed effect or random effects model, not based on the Q value, but what you would actually expect to see. So the question instead should be, are you testing something that you think is reasonable to think that there's going to be exactly the same effect. So kind of like last week when we talked about is a shot being administered, a flu vaccine, where no matter who administers the shot, you expect the same effect to happen. That would be a fixed effect model versus are you expecting there to probably be some variation in what's going on, which is relevant to us for psychological research. And for that reason, you select the model based on what you expect to see. So we still go ahead and compute Q, but we need it for some other measures of heterogeneity, which we'll talk about today. And there are some reasons why that assumption is rarely reasonable. So most of the time, a single mean effect size is not really a good descriptor of the entire distribution of the effect sizes. A lot of times, there are real between-study differences 
uh, the studies are estimating different population mean effect sizes that might be related to each other, but they're not the same things. And so the random effects model really addresses this issue. And there are ways to explore the heterogeneity even after going through the random effects model, which we, were, which we will talk about over the next few lectures. So the measures of dispersion that we will be talking about include these four measures. So the first one is Q. Q is the ratio of the observed variation to the within study error. And we're going to talk about this a lot more. Um, what does that mean in non-statistical terms? When you're looking at your Q value, you're looking at how much either homogeneity or heterogeneity there is across your effect sizes that you're looking at. So if you have, let's say, a really huge Q, then that means there's a lot of heterogeneity. There's a lot of variation among your effect sizes. And you're going to want to explore why that is. If your Q is really, really small, then that suggests that your effect sizes are homogeneous. Uh, homogeneous. <laughs> and so um, that suggests that you're sort of looking at something very similar and tight-knit. So you wouldn't need to explain a bunch of that variation. So very different approaches to, to that and how Q can really interpret what's going on with our effect sizes. Then we have T squared and T. You'll notice that throughout this lecture, I'm going to be talking about both T and tau. So essentially, it's really, really hard for us to know what our tau and tau squared values are for sure. So for all intents and purposes, we will use a very similar value, T and T squared, though most often what we're actually looking for are the tau and tau squared. I will try to keep things straight as I explain that throughout. It's quite complicated, so I don't want to overwhelm you with reasoning for that. But just know that at times I'll be talking about t and t squared, even though we really want to be talking about tau and tau squared. But t and t squared are very close in value to what our tau and tau squared values are. But essentially tau or t, is our between studies standard deviation, and our tau or t squared value is our between studies variance. So thinking about between our studies, we're looking at the standard deviations of those and then also the variance of those. And then we have i squared, which is the ratio of true heterogeneity to observed variation. And this is expressed as a percentage. So what does that mean? I squared is a way for us to look at the percentage of variation, the percentage of observed variation that we're seeing. And that percentage would mean that we're seeing true variation rather than what's expected due to chance. So it's the percentage of true variation that we see instead of what we are expected to see by chance. So we're going to talk about each one of these in more detail. So let's start with Q, our homogeneity statistic or heterogeneity statistic, whichever way you want to think about this. So we're going to be looking at the example that was in the spreadsheet from last week with the Wilson PowerPoint example. And remember that we had 10 studies that we were looking at from that example. So we had 10 effect sizes that we were summarizing. And now we're going to take that a step further from the random effects model, and we're going to add in another column, and that is to figure out what our Q value is, which this is already in the spreadsheet, but I'm just adding in your mind what it is that's new this week from looking at this example. So this last column here is new. And so in order to get Q, the first thing that we need to do is um, we need to take the effect size and square it, and then we need to times that by our weight. 
And so it's the weight multiplied by the effect size squared. And then we're going to sum up that column as well. And for this one, it's 21.24. So last week, you remember that we had summed our weights, which ended up being 269.96. And then we summed our weight times the effect size for each one, and that came to 41.82. And then, of course, we just got our Q value here. So we're going to use, excuse me, then we got our value that helps us reach Q, which is 21.24. So we're going to use all three of these values here at the bottom to help us reach our computation of Q. So we now have those three sums. The sum of the weights is 269.96. The sum of our weight times effect size was 41.82, and then the sum of our weight times our effect size squared was 21.24. Okay. And so we're going to use this lovely formula here at the bottom, and basically that works out to 21.24, which is the value of one sum of W times e squared minus 41.82 squared divided by 269.96. And that comes out to 21.24 minus 6.48, which equals 14.76. So our Q is 14.76. So there's actually another equation that you'll come across in the Bornstein et al. text but it's actually much less comprehensible as to what's going on in its face value. So this equation here is from Lipsy and Wilson, and it's easier for you to see what all is going into this. You essentially end up with the same number, but for the purposes of conceptualizing what's happening, this formula is much more visually comprehensible. So remember, we've just take in the sum of those three columns from the previous slide, and we've taken W times the effect size squared, so that sum minus the weight times the effect size squared, divided by the sum of all weights, and that gives us our Q value. So a little bit more about Q. <clears throat> so when we think about Q, Q is basically the ratio of two sources of variation. So we have the ratio of the between studies variation to the within studies variation. So let's look at these two examples here below. And let's picture that the graph on the left is figure A and the graph on the right is figure B. So in both of these graphs, so in the graph on the left and the graph on the right, we have the same effect sizes plotted. Okay, so we have an effect size here of 0 0.20. This effect size over here is 0 0.20 as well. Then we have 0.25. You can see that this is also 0.25. This one is right at 0 0.50. Same here, so on and so forth. And this one is at about a 0.35, same here. So the only thing that's different between figures A and B, the graphs on the left and the right, is that it's the amount of variation that accompanies each one of these effect sizes. That's really the only difference here. So in figure A here on the left, there's much more variation in each effect size. And the reason we know that is because the standard error term and the variance is greater. So how do we know that? We are looking at the bars that travel on either side outside of the effect size box. And the longer those lines, the wider the confidence interval, which means the larger the standard error and the larger the variance. And so if we look at these 
and how they're plotted, you can see that none of them are really different from one another. They all fit within each other's error because this one, you see these lines are almost completely within this top one's lines. This one overlaps with both of these, this one overlaps with all of these, and this one overlaps with all of these. So there is overlap among all of them. So there's really no difference between any of these that we're looking at. However, in figure B in the graph on the right, the amount of dispersion within each effect size is much smaller because our confidence intervals are much smaller. The bars that travel on either side that are coming outside of either side of the effect size box is much, much smaller. So their standard error and variance were much smaller here. And so in this case, if we look at this effect size that's 0.5, even the edge of its confidence interval does not fit within the first effect size. You see how these two do not overlap whatsoever. So there's definitely now looking like they are separate effect sizes and that there's something different going on here with this data. In figure A, the graph on the left, the amount of error in the first one, the within studies error was enough to make sense of between studies variation that we were seeing. But on the right here in figure B, the amount of within studies variation or within studies error is so much smaller than the between studies variation, which is much more pronounced. So they seem to actually be measuring something different. And a lot of our effect sizes here don't overlap with one another. And so they're not part of the same group. Whereas on the left, this one is in line with this one, is in line with this one, and so on with how long their bars are. So remember, we're looking at those two sources of variation, so between our studies and then within our studies. And that's what we're getting at when we're looking at our Q value. So now let's compare both of these. So the value for Q for figure A on the left-hand side is 2.797, which is a very small value whereas the Q for figure B on the right is 14.891, which is a little bit larger. So this is basically saying that the amount of variation between the studies is definitely larger than the amount of studies, than the amount of variation that we're seeing within the studies. In the confidence intervals, there's not really a lot of overlap going on here. So we have a much larger Q on the right than on the left and we'll get to tau squared and i squared in just a few minutes. So interpreting Q. Q is actually distributed as a chi-square and we can actually just look that value up in the back of any stats text that has tables in it and our degrees of freedom value is going to equal the number of effect sizes we have minus one, or another way of saying that is the number of studies we have minus one. Um, we know that for each study, we're only pulling one effect size. And so that's why that can be interchangeable in how that formula is phrased. But essentially, it's the number of effect sizes or the number of studies we have minus one to get our degrees of freedom. And in the running example for the Wilson PowerPoint example, we had 10 studies, 10 effect sizes, so therefore 10 minus 1 equals 9, so our degrees of freedom is 9. And if we were to look up that value in the chi-square table, we'll find that the critical value for a chi-square that has a degrees of freedom of 9 and an alpha value of 0.05 should come to 16.92. And so in the graph on the left, our Q, we're definitely not surpassing that value of 16.92 here. And on the right-hand side graph, this one is actually not statistically significant either. So in either one of these cases, the value of 
either Q is not statistically significant. If we just take it as an assumption test of whether or not these are homogeneous, then in that case, we would say that both of these, there's homogeneity occurring. But there's definitely something going on that's different on the right than on the left here. So we'll look at that a little bit deeper. A significant Q definitely indicates that the effect sizes vary. But as meta-analysis has grown over the last couple decades especially, more and more thought has been given to this issue of heterogeneity. And at this point, it's definitely believed that a non-significant Q does not prove that the effect sizes are actually consistent or homogeneous. Instead, we actually need to do some further analyses. We need to look at our tau squared, we need to look at our i squared, and we also need to look at funnel plots. This can get pretty complex, but we're just going to do the basic pieces of that for this class. And we want to remember that in the running example, the Q was not statistically significant for either the left or the right graph. So Q is basically the observed weighted sum of squares. And so another way that we can look, <clears throat> that we can look at Q is that we can actually compare it to the expected weighted sum of squares. So this would, this would be looking at how much would we expect that value to be, and it'll be equal basically to the degrees of freedom. So whatever number of studies you have or whatever number of effect sizes you have, minus one. So in this case, again, we're going to expect um, that value to be nine. And if it's larger than that, whatever excess we have is excess variation. So variation that's just not expected. So that gives us a slightly different picture of what's going on. So if we take Q minus our degrees of freedom, so for the left-hand graph, we had that value of 2.797, and then we subtract 9 from that, we end up with a negative number. And what that means is, is there's no leftover variation going on when it's negative because our Q value is less than our degrees of freedom. And so in this case, there would be no excess variation. The amount of variation that we're seeing is simply due to chance. But on the right-hand side graph, we're definitely getting something different. And so if we took that Q value minus our degrees of freedom, so 14.89 minus 9, we're still left with a positive 5.89. So there is some excess variation still here that isn't explained by chance. So there's a little bit more going on. And so we'll take another peek at that. And tau squared and i squared help us do that in different ways. So a couple reasons why we want to look at this a little bit deeper and not just rely on our Q value is that Q is actually very dependent on the number of studies that are included in the analysis. So larger values of Q can just mean that you have a larger number of studies or it could also mean that you have more variation. And it's definitely underpowered as far as a statistical test goes if we're looking up the chi-square and we're determining that statistical significance. It's going to be underpowered if we only have a few studies that we're looking at. And it's not very likely to be statistically significant, like in the example we just showed, because we're looking at five studies for each. And so when we get a Q, we see that there's definitely excess variation and there's more variation than we would expect due to chance, but not enough to make it statistically significant again, because we were only looking at five studies. So it's definitely underpowered because we're looking at so few studies. It can, Q can be overpowered when we look at a large number of studies. 
and we can end up with statistical significance even when there's not much going on there. So because of that, we're not just going to rely on our Q value. We're going to go beyond that and look at tau and I squared. So remember that tau and tau squared are our standard deviation and variance values of the effect sizes. And we'll never know the exact values of tau and tau squared, so we will use a very similar equivalent, t and t squared. But if, but if we are looking at tau, we're using the Greek letters for it, we're looking at the mu, so the mean for the population as a whole, the true means of the population. But most of the time we don't have mu, actually most of the time all we can actually get is just a mean from a sample that we took. And so the same things are going on with tau and tau squared. We're never really going to know the actual true effect size and how much it really varies. So we're just going to be able to estimate that based on the sample of studies that we have. So instead, what we'll have is tau and tau squared. And tau and tau squared, the way that we interpret them is basically on the same scale as the effect size. So Tau squared is equal to the same piece that we were just starting with. So Q minus the degrees of freedom, and that's divided by C. And C is this lovely formula here, which is the sum of the weights minus the sum of the weights squared over the sum of the weights. And we end up with tau squared. So anytime tau squared comes out to be less than zero, so if we end up with a negative number here with Q minus our degrees of freedom, at that point it's considered zero. There's no excess variation, so anytime we get a Q minus a DF in the negative zone, we stop at that point. But if we get anything that's positive, we'll definitely go ahead and finish computing. <clears throat> so tau squared, we alluded to this last week when we were talking about the random effects model. Remember that tau squared is what we use in order to add that value to the constant piece that shows the little bit of variation that we're expecting in the random effects model and we add that to each one of the weights. So that is how the weight is applied in the random effects model. The other thing that we're going to use tau squared for is we can actually use the value of tau squared if we square root um, Q minus DF divided by C and then we end up with our tau value. And tau basically works as a standard deviation for the summary effect size. So we can use that in order to create our confidence interval around the summary effect size. So we can come up with our 95% confidence interval. And we can say that we're 95% sure that the actual effect size for the population falls somewhere between x and y. And we can use that the same way we would for any other. And so we take that tau value times 1.96, and then we add and subtract it from the value of the summary effect size. And then we have I squared. So remember that I squared is interpreted as a percentage of variation. And that percentage of variation is considered to be due to heterogeneity rather than simply just chance. So we're looking at something similar here. We start with Q minus our degrees of freedom. But now, instead of having it on the same sort of scale or measure as our effect size that we're working on, like a Cohen's D, so it fits with the effect size and in interpreting that, we're instead going to express that as a percentage because we have a ratio here. And it's that Q minus degrees of freedom divided by Q. And then we just times it by 100 so that we can express it as a percentage. So basically what we're looking at is the ratio of the excess variation, so Q minus our degrees of freedom, and that's the excess variation, and dividing that by the total variation so that we've got a ratio of excess variation to total variation. And of the variation that we're seeing, we want to look at what part of that seems to be due to true heterogeneity, so true variation, rather than just chance. So in the running example that we have, our Q was 
and our degrees of freedom was 9, and our Q again, 14.76, is in the denominator. And then we multiply that by 100, and we end up with 39% of variation in the running example. So what that means is, is 39% of that variation seems to be due to the actual variation or dispersion in the effect size to a more true version of heterogeneity than just the variation we would expect to see due to chance. And we only multiply it by 100 here so that we can get it from 0.39 to 39 so that we can express it as a percent. So it's basically just looking at that ratio of the excess variation that we have to the total amount of variation that we're seeing so that we can talk about all of the variation we have and what portion of it seems to be due to heterogeneity rather than due to chance. So what if we do have a heterogeneous distribution? What if there's excess variation going on? Then what? At that point, we have two different ways that we can analyze that and see if we can come up with how we explain that. One of those ways is an analog to a one-way ANOVA, which is akin to a one-way ANOVA. And in this case, you're restricted to using a one categorical between studies variable. And this is the one that we're actually going to focus on within the class. But you also have the ability to do a weighted multiple regression analysis. And here, in this instance, we would look at multiple continuous variables and categorical variables to a degree that end up being clunky but would work. And for this, you can use SPSS. You can also use other programs that are out there that are available. Um, but the one that we're mostly going to use is CMA, and I'll have you download the student version of it next week when we run our analyses. Um, it's only a 10-day free trial, so I'll have a specific day that I want you to download that so that we can get the maximized use out of that free trial for you. Um, but in general, the parameter estimates, so the R squared and the beta weights, things like that, those come out fine in SPSS. But the actual F test, the T test, and the associated probabilities actually come out wrong. Um, because we're not looking at raw data at this point, we're looking at study level data. So that's why we use CMA for everything instead. And so for this week, you'll actually be hanging out in your Excel spreadsheet. Um, so I'm going to bring up the Excel spreadsheet really quickly. So we're going to go to the Wilson PowerPoint tab here in this example. So here's the same spreadsheet that we looked at last week. We have the study variables from the Wilson PowerPoint example, and we've added in one more formula this week down here, which is I squared. And you'll notice that the formula for I squared is equal to 100 times the value of um, let's see, G21, so that's Q, um, minus the degrees of freedom, um, divided by Q. And so if you're curious about what any of these formulas is, you can click inside the box and see up above here what the formula equals. So the other thing that we were talking about was tau squared. And if we look at these weights in the random effects model, we'll see that it has, in addition to the variance, they also add in the tau squared value. So G24, which is our tau squared. You can see that that's added in to develop those weights. So that's how tau squared gets incorporated. And that's the component that helps us look at the variation that's going on in the meta-analysis as a whole. And the only dispersion value that is not on here that we also use is tau, but you can get that easily by taking the square root of tau squared.
All right.